everyone. I'm Carl Whitaker, Director of Research and Analysis here at RealPage and one of the rotating hosts of Multifamily Talks, a RealPage podcast. Today's guest was a very special guest. We were joined by Lee Everett with Waterton. He's a VP of Research and of Strategy for the company. And with a title like that, you can guarantee that he's going to have some great research uh, takeaways, both on the market trends, but more specifically in the capital markets. And I think, candidly speaking, Lee offered one of the most succinct and best overviews of the capital market space that I've heard in six years of the industry. So be sure to stay tuned for that. We hope you enjoy. With that, we'll get to the show. With that, I guess we can go ahead and get kicked off. Lee, good to good to see you, even if it's virtually. I know we uh, we had the pleasure of hanging out a couple of weeks ago. So good to good to have you on camera and on video. And thanks for joining for the uh, the Real Page Multifamily Talks podcast series. It's always a pleasure, Carl. I I'm very excited just to chat for a few yeah for minutes sure. Now. And we'll try to we'll try to be cognizant of everyone's time. You know, we're trying not to do these more than 30, 45 minutes, but we'll see how the conversation unfolds. I have no doubt that you and I could probably spend north of two hours talking, but we won't want to eat up too much of everyone's time. <laughs> um, I think before we even get started, though, I've got a list of questions I'm going to work through here. But uh, before we get started, can you tell us a little bit about Waterton? What your role is at the company? I mean, Waterton. Uh, uh, Introducing Waterton to a group of multifamily listeners is kind of like asking LeBron James to introduce himself in front of some basketball fans. But I think it's worthwhile to get a little bit of background on Waterton and and what y'all are doing. Yeah, uh, well, that's glowing praise. I don't know that I go that far, but um, David Schwartz is a a pretty well known man, and he uh, he founded Waterton in 1996. We're a value add multifamily shop. We primarily run off of commingled funds, investing money on behalf of our investors and generating returns to return to them. Um, Our primary strategy being focused on value add makes us a little bit different than a lot of the larger apartment shops out there. Most people are somewhat core or core plus focused. We are a true value add operator. We are vertically integrated. We have both our own in-house construction teams that run the value add projects, as well as our own in-house property management. And I'd say today we're one of the NMHC top 50 owners, and we're looking to continue growing and growing responsibly in this environment, I think I should yeah, say. Yeah, that's a really good way to phrase it. And we'll talk about some of the growth in the, uh, later and some of the the headwinds and tailwinds just to the broader economy and growing in this environment. So wonderful background there. Um, just a little bit about yourself as well, your role at Waterton, how you ended up in this, this amazing position. Yeah. Um, I've been in residential research and analysis for almost 20 years now. Um, I started pre-GFC with a small consulting group called the Concord Group that worked on single family and multifamily analyses, market feasibility, due diligence, things like that for the bigger players in the space. Um, Eventually worked my way over to doing similar at CoStar where I worked for CoStar Advisory Services or what many of you would know as PPR. Eventually, after about four years, well, there I was primarily leading a thought leader in the multifamily space where we essentially consulted for C-level executives, for leadership, for acquisitions team, both on deal specifics and high-level strategy. After that, I spent a little bit of time in the senior space, and I arrived at Waterton a couple of years ago. And here I am the head of research and strategy. Uh, I've been here about two and a half years, and I... I think it's been an absolutely awesome ride. Yeah, I was talking to another guest about that earlier that she has about six, seven years in the industry. And we both kind of joked that the first three years of us being in the industry, call it 2016 to 2019, the research space was, I don't want to say stale, but it was just kind of like, hey, things are pretty good. You know, 3% rent growth to maybe 5% rent growth. Things are steady. There was, wasn't a lot of news and it almost felt like kind of trying to squeeze blood from a rock and trying to come up with storylines, you know, oh, what would be the cause of the next recession? Or, you know, what's going to be the impact of this? And then, Lo and behold, 2020 comes around and just totally turned the world on its head. But it's as you, to your point, it's made the research space a really fascinating avenue to to dive into. And you know, I can only certain I, I can only comment. I imagine what the uh, strategy space looks like in your role, but I imagine that that's been a big focal point too of just how strategy adapts to the changing times. Yeah, and and we've moved quickly. Um, to, to your point, I think in 2015 when I was with. Uh, 
PPR, if you will, uh, we did our first presentation on what might cause the next recession. And I think Moody's was doing the same at the time. And it was literally that every year up until the pandemic. So the space got a little bit dry and it's been a roller coaster ride unlike anything we've seen, I think, over the course of the last two years. First, you have the fear of the pandemic, all the outward migration. Then you have Gen Z coming in with a force and forming households and backfilling where the millennials moved out. And ultimately, you have rent growth that was unprecedented, followed by demand that was pulled forward and evaporating. So we've had to pivot quickly. We've had to be agile. And we, more importantly, have just really shifted strategy in a more conservative and more thoughtful direction. And really, it's about letting the market come to us at this point. Yeah, it's really it's a, it's really interesting, and um, you know it's it's so funny that in the 2010s, you know, the topic became what could cause the next recession. I'd, how many times did you get asked the question, "What inning are we in?" <laughs> oh, that was daily. <laughs> You're just Absolutely. always getting asked that. It's and again, it's funny to reflect upon that now. But um, you know, I, I think broadly speaking, our view of the world aligns generally with what y'all are seeing there as well. That demand got pulled forward in 2021. Today feels like a sharp adjustment, but some of it's just kind of physics 101. What goes up must come down, and I think we're just seeing a rebalancing act. I wish I could remember who said this. It may have been Jim Costello with RCA, but he used the analogy of 2020 was a rubber band that got pulled back. You had a lot of housing demand that was pent up, gets released in 2021. And again, Physics 101, how far you pull the rubber band back corresponds to how much it lets go. But the rubber band doesn't come to equilibrium immediately. You know, it just, it vibrates for a little bit before it finds its its uh, its equilibrium. And I think that's in some ways the market that we're seeing today. Maybe the counter to that is that the capital market side is a little bit more choppy with some of the background noise always uh, interest rate hikes, which at the time of filming our podcast or recording our podcast today, I should say, uh, very timely because tomorrow is the FMOC where we get to see what the signal for the near term looks like. And uh, again, we'll talk about some of these trends throughout, but I think, I think this is going to be a good lively conversation because we just in some ways see the world similarly. Yep. So, um, getting back a little bit to more background before we get into some of the um, some of the talking points on market trends and, and what you're seeing in the data. Uh, last question I had on on background was: um, tell us a little bit about yourself. How did you end up in a research role? Our guest earlier was talking a little bit, uh, and w- it's so funny because she and I share basically the same background in terms of college education, aspirations to get a PhD, but grad school quickly takes the wind out of those sails. How did you end up in the research space? I had a crazy ride. Um, a, I was always interested in real estate. And then my f- first year of college, I went to a school called Youngstown State in beautiful Youngstown, Ohio. And I went there to play football. And um, one of the perks there was I got an internship with the mayor and the local HUD person. And they were working on the essentially the community plan for Youngstown was called Youngstown 2010. This was in 2002. So I was working pretty closely with them with developing the urban renewal plan, figuring out how to focus Youngstown's future. And I was really responsible for bringing the youth voice into that. And that to me was an awesome experience. After that, I transferred to Johns Hopkins, um, sharpened my academic pencils a bit more than my cleats. And there I kind of, I think, grew a lot in terms of writing deeper analysis. And I continued to just have this inkling towards real estate. I had an uncle who was a developer of just single family houses up in Connecticut and started spending the summers with him just to see what he was doing and look at markets and learn about comps. And then when I got out of college, it was just almost a natural transition to end up at the Concord Group where I did end up. And it it was really just interest in migration, interest in what people want, interest in how people live and interest in what drives people to want where to live where they live. So I've always loved the residential sector. I've touched every part of it. I've worked in lie tech. I've worked in single family. I've worked in senior and it's all fascinating to me. And, uh, 
it's it's truly what I think's driven my entire career thus far is just those fascinations. Yeah, that curiosity is something that you can't really teach, but it's so key in a market research role. Just if you're naturally curious about the world around you, you'll find a way to research it. But that's not something that you can teach per se. You know, it's not a uh, it's it's not a I'll use a football term here. It's not a a, a a block where you're you know blocking a gap, or it's not a cut block. It's not a skill you can use. Cut block is probably a bad example because I think those are outlawed now, but. <laughs> <laughs> but um, yeah, it's just it's it's one of those things. It's just it, it, I think it's a key um, to the to the research space is having that natural curiosity. You do mention though that um, you have some background in a really wide breadth of the residential real estate space in particular, and that was can candidly speaking one of the reasons why I wanted to get you on here. Um, one question I had for you is looking at the conventional market rate multifamily space. What are some similarities with other residential property types, and what are some differences that you're looking for um, when acquiring properties? So it, it's interesting, given that we've we've been in the single family space at Waterton here, and we've been in the multifamily space recently. And the way the single family operators typically operate, is almost more of a thematic quantitative approach to investing. They're looking for certain price points, certain boxes checked, and certain homes, and that's what they're looking to build. Multifamily, I think it's, at least on our end, there are thematic quant investors in the multifamily space, particularly long-term holders and such as that. But on our end, on the multifamily side, I think it's a lot more about sharpening your pencils, dotting your I's and crossing your T's, particularly in a value-add platform. It's so difficult to source deals today. So our acquisitions team has to have the incredibly strong relationships. It's so difficult to underwrite renovations today. So our capital team has to deep understand every aspect of that. It's so difficult to price rent comps in a falling rent environment, so our operations team gets involved in that. I think there's just a lot more pencil sharpening. Litech is very different in that it's almost, at least in my experience, driven by generating tax losses and tax credits and CRA credits for banks. So you're out there deploying in lower quality, but much needed affordable housing, essentially taking losses on it and then sending those tax losses back to the bank. So it's an exceptionally different approach. And I think ultimately I've been most impressed by the depth of analysis in the multifamily sector. I think I'm probably least impressed in senior and single family, um, single family, probably the least home builders, they don't do as much analysis as you'd expect, whereas uh, and in the senior space, there's just not as great as data available. Um, everybody tries, but it's really, really hard to wrap your head around all the comps, data, rents, occupancies, et cetera. Yeah, it's an interesting point, and I'm, I'm certainly far from an expert on other sectors of residential real estate. But um, you know, I've heard something similar echoed with seniors' housing: is that it's just it's hard to wrap your arms around the data that you need. Um, it's still a pretty nascent sector in some ways at least in its current iteration. Um, and then lastly, single family, some of that just comes down to physical footprint. You need a lot more room to build at scale. So some of those more nuanced researchy techniques are, I guess, kind of falling by the wayside if the simple question is just, do you have the land to acquire and then build upon? Yeah, we spoke to a mid-sized home builder not that long ago, and their business plan is legitimately build in an outer ring if the if the community is absorbed at their targeted absorption of six homes a month build a bit further out and keep doing that until it stops working it's it's just a dramatically different approach. And this is a nationally known mid-sized home builder. Yeah, that's fascinating. And again, that's where it's it's so interesting hearing from folks that have worked in other sectors of the business. And just for the audience, a little bit about myself, my uh, proxy way of entering the research space was first job out of college, worked with a uh, economic development consultant here in Dallas, and we were subscribers to Axiometrics at the time, which was, of course, uh, acquired by RealPage, I guess, in 2016, if memory serves me correct. But um, what I'm getting at there is that the 
information looked at from an economic development perspective was in some ways similar to the research we're doing now, but there was also this element of you're trying to fit within a broader plan. You know, you're trying to fit within the, the, the in, in our case, the city's 10 year economic development plan. So I'll use it for the sake of example. There was a city we were working with that had kind of this undeveloped quadrant of their town. And in fact, I think it was actually uh, outside of their ETJ, but was soon about to be part of the ETJ. So they almost had this blank slate where they said, okay, we've got how many ever hundreds of acres it is. What do we put in this area that makes the most sense for 10? 20 years from now? Is it office? Is it single family? Is it a mix of multi and, and retail? You know, what does that mix look like? So um, I think it's it, it's interesting to see how the research application can be applied to different parts of the equation. Now, the reason I bring all that up is that you say that you had traditionally started working with the Youngstown Economic Development um, or I guess the redevelopment um, uh, efforts that were happening there. In your current role, how closely do you work with some cities? Is that something that's a little bit, a little layer removed from what you're doing, or is that something that you still bring into the equation? I would say it's generally a layer removed. Um, we roll in and out of properties our typical hold times five to seven years. So it's hard for us to have an, as much saturation as you'd need for that. We don't really do a lot of development. You will come in as a partner in development, but we're never going to be really leading the charge. So there's a lot less on that end. Um, I do think our presence in Chicago is meaningful. I, I think that we've had a strong relationship with the city over the years, given that I believe we're the largest owner here by unit count and volume. So I, I think it's meaningful here. But elsewhere, I think there's been a bit less of that interaction. But to your point, a lot of these analyses are very similar that these local towns are doing. So it's it is a very similar train of thought. And I like to think we're picking sites intelligently enough that we're helping what is their ultimate growth. Goals. Yeah, it's almost like a proxy way of supporting them. It's not necessarily the direct initiative per se, but with smart growth comes with smart strategy comes smart growth. Uh, and, and, and that's what ultimately helps the cities in the long run. I think that's something that kind of gets lost in the mix within the multifamily space at times is that, you know, an individual property is often what we're asked to analyze or maybe a sub market level. But when you look at the longer term scale of growth happening in these markets and really the country, at large, multifamily provides a very critical need. And, you know, you mentioned earlier, too, that uh, there's a need for more housing units, certainly more affordable housing units. And you see some of those organizations that help provide that. But, you know, I think that when you when you zoom out and look at multifamily, it fits together in a part of a broader scale of things. And I think some folks give it credit for Absolutely. And I think that more than anything, the changing demographics of the U.S. and what we've seen over the last 20 to 30 years in terms of household size, people per household, delayed marriage, less births. I think multifamily has become more vital to the housing stock than it ever was before. And I think that has very much been proven out by what we're building. We've got a million units under construction, and we've only got 700,000 single family homes or so. So you've seen a shift, and I do believe deeply that that shift has been made to meet the needs of the modern American household. Now, do I believe that we might be building a little bit too much expensive stuff? Sure. Do I think that the market will handle that in the long run and these cities will absorb it and return to long term trend? Absolutely. Do I think maybe we should have built some more in the suburbs in the late 2010s, knowing the millennials were going to age? Absolutely. I think we might have missed that boat. But for the most part, if you look at what's happened across America, particularly coming out of the GFC, it, it was a beautiful reurbanization of our country. You had places like Uptown Charlotte rise out of nowhere. You had the West Loop in Chicago completely develop and become the most vibrant submarket in the city and the most attractive. It, it really was an incredible thing. And I like to think multifamily was at the forefront. Yeah, I absolutely agree with that. And I love that you said reurbanization because my, my, my nerdy research brain is, has a background in geography. And that was kind of the idea that we studied was how do cities develop over time? How do humans influence that and vice versa? How do demographics get influenced by some of these trends? And it's really neat to see it come all 
together. And I love that you even reference very different um, market makeups there. You know, West Loop characteristically is very different than uh, what is it called? Noda and Charlotte, you know, that area just north of downtown there. Um, I may have got that exact name wrong, but, you know, just some of those fastly, quickly urbanizing areas within different markets. Um, and you also actually took one of the questions out of my mouth and I'm going to revisit it because I think you were touching on it really well. Uh, what are some of the key drivers you're looking at, maybe beyond the typical job growth or population growth? What are some of those more nuanced or uh, kind of new agey metrics that you're looking at, whether quantitatively or qualitatively, uh, that you think some others could get some utilization out of? We focus a lot on sort of now cast demographics at a very micro market level. So I, I'm a strong believer that a deal can make sense in any market if the deal is structured correctly. If you're buying in an extremely high supply market, you can pull it off if you're buying at the right price, if you have enough rent spread to absorb concessions and things along those lines. So we start with just a quick micro market growth and demographics analysis. I know you said not to worry about that, but then we lean really heavily into incomes. Um, being a value add shop, we have to be very cautious of pushing rents too far to make them unaffordable to stretch things. So measuring rent to income ratios, keeping those in line with where they should be relative to ending rent is very vital. In terms of market selection, I think we look at sort of two sides of the coin. In a workforce market, we're focused on what are the demand drivers? Is it a logistics market? Is it a, where, is it a back office market? We're much less likely to be in a back office node today than we are in a logistics node. And just as importantly, if there's no demographic growth, we're fine with that, provided there's no supply and the rent to income checks out. So we're happy to operate in a market like that, provided the local demand driver is there. We also, in terms of in a high supply market, like if we were looking in downtown Nashville, as I inferred earlier, it would really be all about how much of a rent spread we can maintain in order to absorb the absolutely, I believe, coming concessions. And for us, it's a bit trickier given that we're a five, seven year whole long time typically that's less time for that supply to get absorbed so we can't really just plan to ride it out on a 10-year time horizon as most long-term hold developers do or owners do so we look at that stuff i look at some of the migration numbers um the cell phone migration stuff it sometimes works sometimes doesn't i'm, I'm still readily struggling with it um in terms of data, I'm real excited about to plug real page. Once you all get your migration data sorted out between who's moving where, I think that's going to be incredibly valuable to the space. But the answer is a lot of everything. Um, our demographics provider is owned by Altus uh, Stratodem. They're very modern, cutting edge, heavily modeled. And it's really relying on people like them and people like yourself and focusing on the makeup of the micro market versus the larger Yeah, I love as, as you're talking there, it's interesting to hear how the research influences the strategy, but the strategy influences the research and how those two things meld together and why a role such as yours incorporates both research and strategy. Yeah, I, I think sort of primarily we're looking to buy B assets and make them B plus or A minus assets to give people slightly nicer, but still relatively affordable homes to live in. And that is our core strategy. It's our core driver. And you have to have research in order to verify that that strategy is going to work in X. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So we were talking a little bit earlier and how, you know, being a level or two removed from, I think the conversation at hand was um, a level, level or two removed from working directly with cities. Uh, I personally am a level or two removed from capital markets trends, but one of the reasons why I wanted to have you on as a guest and you were so kind with your time, thankfully, um, it was that I wanted to uh, tap into your brain and get a little bit for uh, a little bit of insight, I should say, on the capital market side of the equation. What are two or three trends you're seeing in the capital markets that you think our listeners or viewers should be aware of as we get through the second half of 2023? I think to start to answer that question, you really have to start to talk about interest rates and you have to start to talk about inflation. Um, I don't know that anybody has been beating the shelter inflation is coming down drum harder than Jay <laughs> from your shop, but 
that I think is kind of where a lot of this starts. Do you believe that we're in for a major recession still? Or are you one of those people coming around that it's going to be a soft landing, maybe a mild recession in 2024? And I think that really dictates a lot, because if this is a soft landing, you fully expect higher for longer interest rates. The 10 year has been moving up consistently since the po- since the CPI reading after falling, but you're still, it's been living in a three, seven to four range now for a prolonged period of time. And that is very elevated relative to what the market is used to. And as a shop, I think we're coming more along to the soft landing, mild recession, and that's gonna mean that higher for longer. And what does that mean? Higher cap rates. Well. When you want to buy at higher cap rates, sellers don't want to sell at higher cap rates. So what we've seen in the market is a large bid ask spread develop. You see deals getting done, but primarily they're one off deals that are either loan assumptions, which are easily executable today. You can still buy a loan at 3.25 and you can have a lower cap rate or you've seen special assets, core assets that need to be removed that long term owners fully believe in trade. But for the most part, Transaction volume has really dried up. We've seen deals coming back to us two, three, four times now. And that is a trend that we expect to continue as we wait for the market to come to us. Ultimately, transactional cap rates are still executing well above appraisal cap rates. And until that delta closes, we're going to hold this bid ask spread because the values that people have on their books, they're going to struggle to get in the open market today. And assets that we've bought in the last year have been unique stories. The last asset in a core fund that had already met its returns, a deal that was a HUD assumption loan. So you're talking about an exceptional interest rate in a recovery market, a suburban deal that we got into at a very high cap rate outside of a major MSA, but also that has no supply threatening it in great schools. So we've really been looking at unique stories as the majority of the market's kind of locked up and staring at each other and bidding, but not necessarily transacting. Yeah, today. a little bit of a game of chicken where it's just who moves first, who's going to be the first, kind of like playing a game of poker. It's who's going to signal who has that hand first. Um, and by the way, if you ever were to teach a college class, I would totally take this if it was focused on real estate, because I think you did a good job there of breaking things down in a very applied manner, but not so applied that it lacked on, well, here's kind of the theory behind it. So um, really good job of breaking that down. I thought that was a, uh, and, and again, this is coming from someone myself that doesn't have a lot of influence or a lot of, um, a lot of background on the capital market side of things. Yep. For, for sure. And, and I'm happy to add there. And yeah, ultimately it's going to come down to CPI and the fed. And I tend to believe that CPI is going to t- continue coming in and the fed's going to, chill out here pretty quickly. Uh, The one interesting thing, though, that is starting to become a slight concern to me, well, there's two. One is we're doing all this reshoring and building all this manufacturing and building all this infrastructure. We don't really have the labor for it. So that's going to be some upward pressure on wages. And also with consumer sentiment starting to spike back up again as people aren't really afraid of the mild recession, that could potentially have some slight inflationary impacts down. Yeah, this is where it's fun to play economist and, you know, look at look at a, a scenario from multiple different perspectives. And I think right now there's a lot of different scenarios that could play out. And again, I wish I could remember who published this article, but it was about this time last year. And it was talking about that same idea that, um, you know, if the economy is relatively strong the same time next year, which at the time this was written was, you know, call it spring 2022. If the economy is still relatively strong, does that put upward pressure on things like wages in the scenario that inflation is falling? Well, if wages start to increase and that kind of counters that, uh, that argument or that, um, that, how that plays out. And, you know, the, basically the argument that this article was making that was that one of the downside risks would be almost this, I hesitate to call it a W-shaped recession because I don't know that we've actually entered a quote unquote recession. Uh, I mean, certainly the job growth stats wouldn't say that. But, you know, is if things cool off because interest rate hikes, that kind of spooks the market. But then things start to thaw out, even when interest rate hikes uh, remain pretty high, then that kind of removes one of the tools from the Fed's toolkit 
absent of hiking rates more, but that's something that, you know, uh, it was just kind of neat to hear this perspective 12, 16, 18 months ago and see how it's not necessarily played out just like that, but hear the perspective that was being offered there. Yeah, we have more working age people as a share of population working today, basically than ever in history. And we have a lot of potential jobs coming down the line in manufacturing, chip production, battery production. And I just I think we're going to have continued upward wage pressure. And that's another reason I'm more in the higher for longer camp. I think things settle 25, 26. But, yeah, there's going to be real challenges to grow our labor market enough to ease that side of the coin. And frankly, it might be too tight for the Fed to really impact without crazy actions. And I don't see that on the horizon. Today. Yeah, I tend to, I, I also tend to lean towards that same side of the argument. And I think, again, one of the reasons why we see the world pretty similarly. Um, so that's the capital market side. If you can put on your market research cap, what are two or three trends, maybe just one key trend? Um, what are some things you think that people should be looking at in the market? I guess, phrase it differently. Somebody listens to this and in 2024, they say, man, I should have listened to Lee on that market trend. What would you say the one or two trends are in terms of market performance? I continue to th see the sort of B space as so isolated given the depth of market between it and C and it may currently is the safest space. And I think that can give you some flexibility, but in terms of markets and, and what I mean by flexibility is that's the only way I think you can really play in the high supply markets for a shorter term hold today. But in terms of markets, we are, I'd say almost market agnostic within our footprint, which is roughly the top 30 markets in the U.S. We fully believe in the long term migration trends to the Sun Belt. But we also understand that this happened when the baby boomers were at the same age as the millennials. And it was backfilled by legal international migration in the major cities. So we are agnostic in that we will make growth plays at proper pricing in markets we like. I'm a little scared of Nashville and Austin, just given the supply in the very short term in the cores of those markets and some of the fundamental issues in Austin, but that doesn't mean we won't execute there. We fully believe, and I tend to continue to believe that suburban deals in any of these growth markets that are in strong locations are great to look at. I continue to fully believe in suburban deals that are isolated from supply and have good school districts in the core markets, as well as some of the secondary markets like a Philadelphia, like a Chicago. You've seen even here in Chicago, there's neighborhoods within the city still growing, a Lakeshore East, a Bucktown, a West Loop. But you've seen also large scale migration out to the suburbs that has stayed there. And that's going to need to be served and that's going to continue to push migration. So I'd say suburban plays, avoid supply unless you're buying at a major discount. Wait for a developer to get in trouble and come in and try to buy, the, buy him out when he can't refinance his construction loan. But market wise, avoid micro market population loss deeply. Avoid anything that stretches incomes because you really rents are going to have downward pressure in the coming year, I believe. I don't know how negative they'll go, but I don't think you're going to see strong rent growth by any means. So if you stretch incomes, you're going to pay for that down the line. And ultimately, if you are fighting to get in front of population growth, which a lot of people are, be cautious and be aware of your whole time. I, I don't think it's worth forcing it to buy at a four cap in downtown Nashville today when it might come back to you at a better deal down the line. And frankly, you're going in at negative leverage with where rates are today in that scenario, even with Fannie and Freddie. So market wise, we're a bit more agnostic to market and a bit more focused on strategy. And I tend to believe that's the way you have to operate today because it's it's to me about rifle shots. It's about finding that one specific deal, nailing it and hitting it correctly. It's not about we love Nashville. We're just going to build, build, build there because the capital markets dislocation makes that a difficult 
strategy to execute. On I love today. that analogy of a rifle shot versus a shotgun. Uh, you know, just and and with the market play, I think you're right, especially considering that markets can have something that changes on a whim that you have no control over. A broad based strategy, you know, something fundamental in the makeup of America's population or something fundamentally economic is going to have to change. But you know, a market some black swan event can really knock that market off the course a lot faster than spreading out across uh, you know a more diversified portfolio but especially a a sound strategy at the at, at its core uh, absolutely and I think it's most important today to focus on that core strategy. Yeah, I would tend to agree. Um, so I'm going to actually switch it a little bit here. We wanted to make sure that the web, or the, I keep on saying webcast, I do so many webcasts that I just default to that instead of podcast. But uh, the podcast, I wanted to get a, uh, a little bit more on the informal side. I think this is a good way to kind of showcase some uh, forefront researchers in the space and get to know a little bit about their personality. If you weren't in the multifamily research space, what do you think you would be doing today? You know, I, I really am struggling with that question, <laughs> uh, which is a wild answer to have, uh, you know, at this stage in my career. Um, I don't find office interesting. Um, I feel like logistics is a bit more supply chain management, but I could see myself in there. Retail... Maybe, but for the most part, I kind of feel like I'm home. I think if I weren't here, I'd probably be more focused on being an in-house economist at one of the banks, something like that. And it would have been follow that path and really kind of blow out the academic journey. But one of the things I truly love about where I am and what I'm doing, especially at Waterton, I, I have the flexibility to play economists, to look at deals, to help with the investor relations and fundraising side. I, I get to touch every side of the house. I get to work with portfolio management. So it's so deeply enriching and I'm doing so many different things, even within a single sector. It's really hard to conceptualize change. Yeah, and it sounds like you found your life calling in many ways then, but I love too that you get to work with multiple facets. You know, you said earlier that Waterton's vertically, vertically integrated, so clearly you're going to be touching a lot of different components of that chain, um, uh, uh, that, that chain of process in the company. So I think that's great, not only for um, breadth of knowledge, but for application of knowledge where you can kind of see around some of those corners and say, hey, this is what, this is what our acquisitions team is seeing. How is that going to impact maybe the, uh, and I'm making this up for the sake of example, but how is this going to impact the property management team six months from now? Or are they just totally unrelated? Well, at least you get the exposure to both. So you can kind of calibrate that understanding. For sure. And I, I think one final answer is I've kind of come to it is I've always been told I should go become a paid speaker. So maybe I'd do that and just really, really pull in the dollars for just talking. Well, I think I just told you too, that I think you'd be a fantastic <laughs> professor. So maybe you really should look at moonlighting at some <laughs> local colleges and, um, you know, you're, you're located in Chicago there, so there's no shortage of colleges, I'm sure, that are looking for some guest lecturers. Yeah, I, I am certain. I, I, I could consider that down the line, but Waterton keeps yeah. me plenty busy right <laughs> yeah, now. Yeah, I imagine you've got plenty on your plate <laughs> as is, so no need in biting off more than you could chew for the short term. Um one other question that we've been asking some guests thus far is, you know, let's say, let's say you're 20 years old, you're in college, or maybe you're looking for a career change. What would be some advice you would give to somebody starting out on this path of market research, specifically in uh, apartments, but if not just apartments and more broadly, the research space, what, what would be some key advice you would give folks? I think I'm going to give some advice that seems to almost disagree with itself. Um, I, I think the first thing you have to do is you have to deeply understand and have a desire to understand data. You have to be able to deep dive, sort things, see trends, see, and this might be the most important skill, see when something doesn't make sense in the data so you can see if it's right or not. Because more often than not, when data doesn't make sense, it could have been an input error. It could be, or it could equally be a, a new trend developing. So. I think that is exceptionally vital. But also as you grow, you have to maintain that ability to see sort of the minutia, but you have to grow and add more big picture perspective. It, it becomes more and more macro as you develop in this space because you do become more 
relied on for strategy, more relied on for in-house economics, more relied on as sort of a thought leader within the space. So you have to start out with this deep understanding and data drive and be able to build that into a more macro understanding of the space. I love that become more than just one singular focus on the data and trends, but being able to put it together in a total package. And um, I also really like your point there. When you see a data point, you're like, that doesn't seem right. It kind of goes hand in hand with this idea that you may not run into this as often. I feel like I run into it all the time, but when you have a hypothesis that turns out like it may be wrong and you start digging into it, that's actually kind of fun in some ways. Cause especially over short term versus long term, cause that's one of the challenges in our, our roles as researchers is that nobody's going to be a right a hundred percent of the time on a hundred percent of time horizons. And you'll have a hypothesis that maybe over the short term is catching some flack, but you stick to your guns and lo and behold, three, five years later, everybody's like, Hey, that was actually right. And sometimes there's something that maybe you missed the mark on, you know, there's been market forecasts that, you know, I thought would maybe be a little bit stronger than they actually ended up being over that three to five year period. And there's been some that we've been pretty steadfast behind and lo and behold it plays out that way but it's it, it, like you said it's this fun little i don't want to say game we can play necessarily but it's this fun little uh, space that we can live in where we're really just offering our best insights but it goes so far beyond just interpreting the data um also kind of goes hand in hand with the, the the podcast guest we recorded just right before you where she approaches the space from a very qualitative research and i think that that's equally important in some ways that the quantitative stuff will go a long way in explaining trends. But at the end of the day, especially in apartments, it's people that we're working with. And there's always that psychological component that no amount of quantitative data can explain away. Fully agree. The, the ability to combine the qualitative and the quantitative is vital in this space. And, and if you just want to focus on the quantitative, I would say get a data science degree and become a quant because that's that's a different world. Um, to be a real estate multifamily researcher, you really need to be able to look at the full picture. Yep, I absolutely agree. And I, I assume that it applies to other avenues of research as well. But I, I totally agree that that's probably one of the, uh, the big foundational truths that you have to hold in starting out in this space. And it takes a little bit to develop. But over time, I think that that's how you can really eke ahead, if you will. Um, all right. So last question. We've, you've been generous with your time. We're at 41 minutes. So I don't want to go too far over the, the 45 minute mark for our listeners listeners as well. But um, what are, I guess, what are you looking forward to the most in both your personal and work life over the next, call it six months to a year? What's got you excited about the future? Um, Work-wise, I think it's going to be an incredible ride over the next 12 months. Um, and I don't want to insult anyone that might be listening, but there are some people out there that really overlevered floating rate debt and bought it two and a half and three caps that I think the chickens might be coming home to roost a little bit for. And frankly, we're eagerly awaiting that opportunity. Um, I think some developers out there in high supply nodes are going to struggle to hit their underwritten rents, and then they're going to struggle to refinance coming out of their construction loans. We're eagerly awaiting that opportunity. And if the distress never shows up, if nothing crashes, we'll find a way to pivot and push our B strategy. So I think it's going to be all about agility. And I think that's exciting. And honestly, I think by Q1 next year, we're going to know if the soft landing was the right call or if the mild recession was the right call. So I think work-wise, we've got a ton coming down the pipe. Um, in terms of personal, my wife and I get a new puppy hey. in two days. Um, it will be a whole eight weeks old. So it will be a lot of chaos and challenging, but it will be exciting. And we're really what looking kind forward of to it. What We are getting a Rhodesian oh, nice. Ridgeback. Yeah, I had a friend here, actually a, co a former coworker here that had one. And just so cool standing over it. You could totally see right on the spine. It, it's almost like the hair goes a different direction. I, I guess that's kind of what it, what does happen, really. It is, yeah. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. So, and we're, I'm a big hound guy. The last pup was a greyhound. So we'll try the Ridgebacks out. Yeah. They're, they're, they're big dogs and they seem a little bit intimidating at first, but they're just big, sweet. I mean, it's so rare that you find a dog that's actually uh, malicious. You know, most dogs are just as, as good as they come. 
Absolutely. Yeah. And we're, we're very excited. And it was, it was a careful time picking the breed, but everything we looked up in terms of family obedience, everything checked. Yeah. And boxes. that's exactly what this dog was, was a great family dog. And, uh, you know, just a, a, a big lovable elf and just, a, a, a although I guess your, your, yeah. yours is going to be a pup starting out at just eight weeks old, but that'll be a good journey. Well, good luck with, with raising the dog there. Um, and I'm sure we'll stay in touch again. Uh, just wanted to give you a last call it 30 seconds, one minute here to, um, tell some folks where they can find more about Waterton and more about your, uh, yourself there. Yeah. Um, first off, anytime anyone wants to reach out, please ping me on LinkedIn. I'm more than happy to speak to anyone in the research space, be it a young person looking for advice or an older compatriot that just wants to talk about what we're seeing in the macro environment. Uh, in terms of Waterton, you can find us at waterton.com or you can find us in any of about 20 markets in the country where I am sure we are operating a building near you. Um, and just thank you for your time, Carl. It's always a pleasure when we get a chance just to chat. And it's hopefully we get to do it every couple of months as we yeah, have. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> and I'll holler at you next time I'm up in Chicago and we'll see if our paths can cross. I'm usually up there about three times a year. So thanks again for your time, Lee. Always wonderful catching up with you. And we'll chat again soon. Awesome. Thank you, Carl. Bye-bye. Thanks for joining us for another episode of Multifamily Talks, a real page podcast. As always, the views expressed are those of the individuals participating and not those of RealPage.